We were live uh, with Johnny, young Bosch. Johnny's a little bit blurry right now. Oh, no, am I? <laughs> yeah, there he is. Yeah, is it? <laughs> oh, he faded in. That's pretty cool. There you go. I uh, did that on Throw this out to the uh, audience real quick. Uh, how's our uh, audio coming through? Make sure that you guys can hear us. Check, check, before. check. Yeah. Uh, hello. This is not a high budget operation, um, but I think uh, I think I think we've tested it thoroughly, so we should be okay. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you so much for uh, chatting again. Uh, I think yeah. we I think we did that interview. It's been months. Um, yeah. Unless you grew the goatee within the last five minutes, I'm not sure. <laughs> No way. <laughs> um, so, uh, can you just talk about what uh, what you've been up to um, lately? Yeah. Well. Um, well. Let's see. Uh, a lot of voiceover. Um, let's. Uh, I've been going to uh, conventions and things like that. Um, I, uh, I since then I did shoot a film, um, kind of a personal project. Uh, most. It's I've got most of it shot. Uh, I saved the uh, final like action sequence, um, kind of till later, but because I wanted to cut all the I wanted to shoot all the actors out first, and then uh, see how much time I need for the fight. Um, and so yeah, and plus the action it's it, it, the action would involve me a lot, and it was easier to shoot you know other people and their stuff first and get that done, and then so obviously a lot harder if I have to like go be on the camera or on camera rather than behind it. So I did that too. Um, just kind of plugging away, you know, and the same stuff. You're wearing a lot of hats on your project. I mean, maybe this is something that people don't really know you as well for as a filmmaker, because I mean, you do have a lot of his, a lot of experience behind the camera in your days, don't you? I do. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I mean, that's, I learned a lot of it when I was, you know, on Power Rangers. So back in 94, you know, that kind of was like, it was like film school, really, you know. Um, and so definitely got a lot of uh, uh, my knowledge from there. And then and obviously just working with a bunch of other people, Koichi and whoever else. But uh, yeah, so, uh, and anytime I do my own kind of project, I, I end up, I, I always wear far too many hats. And then I go, oh, yeah, that's yeah. why. I need a prop person. Oh yeah, that's why I need somebody to do. You need somebody to call catering. You need somebody right. to yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, not easy. Yeah. <clears throat> so how uh so as a filmmaker, how does that affect you? Or I guess I should say, your knowledge of filmmaking, how did that lend to you as a performer? How did that lend to your performance skills? Oh, that's uh my performance skills. Yeah, did did directing other performers help you sort of direct yourself? Oh yeah, I mean, well, when you're when you're doing, it's almost like uh, if you study martial arts and then you start teaching martial arts, it gives you a different perspective and it kind of rounds you out a little bit more. Um, so definitely, directing, I, directing actors, I I do have. I do feel like maybe I approach it differently as like someone who understands the actors. Um, I, I feel like maybe I can speak their language a little more. I also want to see them do their thing first before I add any kind of adjustments. Cause I know sometimes I'm like, well, let me try what I have in my mind. And if it's totally wrong, then, then, then correct me or then move me from there, but don't like start off and give me, you know, ideas. Cause then I might get confused. So, so it does give me, um, an understanding or perspective that's a little bit different, or at least I feel that way. I also kind of just, you know, understand how it works when I'm just the actor, you know? Um, and sometimes that could be frustrating. Uh, like when I shot something else I was working on and I was just an actor in it and I was like, boy, they are spending a lot of money on doing all these other things when you know, it could be, you know, fixed by doing this and this and this, whatever, like I can see, but like, usually when there's a slightly bigger budget, that's, it's just kind of, you know, I'm not sure if it's because the responsibility falls on somebody who's not good, that n doesn't know, or there's, you know, somebody in charge that doesn't know how to delegate, uh, properly or whatever it is. But I, I don't, I, I just know that whenever I've worked on projects, I'm not trying to say, I'm trying not to say something very specific, but it's, it's, there's things that you can see and go like, ah, you, 
you really don't need to spend, you know, that much money to make this happen right, you know. Um, and there are times when you definitely need to spend money and times when you're like, eh, that's not something you need to waste money on. Does it take you out of the moment when you have those thoughts as an actor? It it depends on what it is. It depends on, you know, what that is. Like, like it would not often but but i uh, it it would it only happens if i if i'm it only really happens if i'm like actually either producing or directing or doing something else and then also acting that's where i can see myself kind of be pull, get pulled out of it cuz then i i can't 100% like i have to like go like oh that's not the way the camera should be moving you know or uh oh, that doesn't feel right let me go watch it and go like, okay yeah so then it's a lot easier for me to be behind the camera and then just kind of like, you know, well, you know, the same, it's just like when you shoot action, it's like, you kind of just know where, if you were holding the camera, like if you, you know it, like, you know, the choreography and you just know, well, I know if he's going to kick, I'm going to maybe need to go down or I'm going to need to pan with him or whatever, you know, it's just that sort of thing. It's like, you could, you know, you could just put the camera on and just do it. Um, whereas somebody who maybe doesn't have that knowledge, you kind of have to go through it a few times, you know, um. So it could, it could take you out of it. It definitely has taken me out of it. Hmm. I imagine wearing all the hats too. is just because especially if you're, if you're doing an indie style or if you're doing, you know, you're basically doing a producer role as well. Um, and I remember on, on death grip, there was a day, I think I can't remember which day it was, but there was a day when I, I was doing this, like the hard, really difficult fight and I was injured. And then I was thinking about catering <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to do the fight. I'm, I'm, <laughs> Why am I thinking about catering right now? <laughs> like it's it's like equally sized hat. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, that that makes sense. I get that. I mean, even like when I was shooting, because you know you, I don't have a huge budget, you know, and so we were only there for a day, and so I'm like, I know time is kind of an issue, and so like sometimes when I'm acting, I'm like, oh, let's rush, let's just get to the end of it, and I'm like, nah, really, you need to just spend more time, and if I go watch it, I'm like, I should have spent more time on that the thought that was in my head and I could see myself turning it off and going back into like, all right, we need to move. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Like breaking character too soon or something. Mm. Yeah. I, and this is something that, you know, I, I, I think we probably looked at Jackie Chan and Simo Hung and these guys for, for this reason, because they made their own movies a lot of the time. They would Jackie, oh, yeah. not as much as Sammo directing himself, but still uh, without a doubt, he's thinking about, camera placement editing as he's performing are you are you sort of thinking of that stuff as well when you're doing action scenes are you thinking of the camera like can you feel it can you feel the edit what is that yeah like? yeah for sure well i mean i wrote the script too so it's like it's extra that you know um and so like i when i write it i have like this vision in my head but then whenever i find a location it's like oh it's not exactly and so i have to make those adjustments then uh there um, based on the location and then if something else goes wrong you know or so, there's always like some other thing you know that happens like ah oh, they we can't do this choreography because you know this person is left-handed or whatever it is right and then, so you have to make these adjustments and they go well what am I going to do so so yeah I do kind of do the I I do edit things in my head um, and I learned that actually from Koichi uh, which I may have mentioned this in the thing but uh, like he had a way of just kind of like stopping before moving on and editing in his head to make sure he got everything and i i do that a lot too and i go oh man i missed a kick let me let me get an insert of this or that you know um yeah is that something that you're doing before you even shoot begin shooting the fight yeah yeah i yeah in my mind i see a certain way for it to play out um and and 90 percent of the time something will happen and it could, and a lot, oftentimes it's just like, we're running out of time. So we got to cut this chunk of fight out, you know, but I really like the end of it. What are we going to chop out out of here? And so then I, I, I go through and I'm like, all right, well, I can lose this. I could still stay on this line, you know, or maybe I'll jump over here. I'll, I'll do a, a, a quick cut or something that'll take me where it needs to be, you know? Um, so, so that can happen. Are you, are you doing the soundtrack as well? I am. Yeah. Are you thinking about that while you fight? I, I am. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes I even write the music ahead of time. Um, so I have like almost a, a, like a, the pace, 
you know, the BPM. Um, so I'll have like a bed sometimes and I'll listen to that before I go into it so that I kind of have that, that feeling, you know, or if it's like something that's really slow and it's got a lot of atmosphere to it or ethereal or whatever, it's like, then, then it's like, well, you know, I have like a, I do, I can kind of more feel it, I guess. Um, but I do. Yeah. I've, I've been writing it. I, this one though, I am, I, I originally wasn't going to, but I, I think maybe it's just because I gotta be all kind of all hands on. Um, and so I'm doing a lot of it, but I'm trying to give some of it to others, you know, and be like, oh, it kind of feels like this, mm-hmm. you know, um, and then I'll send some piece that, you know, I wrote yeah, I see. Or the, 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 the pace I want. Mm. Um, you got a bunch of questions coming in. Uh, uh, we were talking about action directing. So, uh, Benny Mamashiro asks, who's your favorite action director? Huh? Uh, probably Koichi. I <laughs> just, uh, just because I have, uh, uh, real firsthand, like, no, I worked with him quite a bit and, uh, I just, I've worked with other directors as well that are that are great action directors. Um, but I when the when there's a lot of things that are happening happening that are wrong, and then that you just, they a normal person would get completely stressed out, and maybe start yelling at people or whatever. Kuichi never did that, you know. Kuichi was always really kind of like he kept it pretty light, even when the situation was like, dude, we're not gonna get this or whatever. Um, he was always really joking or laughing you can hear him laughing at things um and so you you didn't mind actually doing a little extra for him or whatever you know um so i i would definitely say koichi yeah. what did, what was his attitude towards um and i apologize if this has been answered on the podcast already but what was his attitude towards um how how to shoot falls and dangerous things was he was he very cautious and just trying to like would he just have someone do it once get it the first time and just shoot it or would he did he have people do the stunt over and over until it like looked right what was his attitude in that regard well yeah i'd know that we whenever there was something that was dangerous he he yeah a lot of times we would just shoot it once um uh the dangerous stuff or like we would have like a plate of uh glass or like breakaway glass right and it was like well we only got one actually it was shipped to us and it was cracked on the corner um so there's no way of like making it where he was like well whatever and he just opened up the window and held it like a guy held it as you know whoever it was taught a hero or or whatever like just just crashed through it or whatnot exactly um but yeah it it was he he, they i mean first off those guys were just they just knew what they were doing there were mistakes that happened but um a lot of times you'd be like, ah, that's, that's a good mistake. It actually looks real or whatever. It looks a little better. I think the only time that he ever, it was like me. Like I was the one that would get injured. Like the first take would be fine. The second take, I split my head open. It's like, well, I guess we got that. Um, but yeah. So, so as a filmmaker, what have you, um, like what have you taken from working with Koichi and applied to your own films? My first thought is, is, um, really just trying to keep a light set um and that that can be really hard to to do um because it it is even this last thing i shot you know we're running out of time every single day it felt like um some days it was like okay we got that stuff i'm surprised did we get everything um but there are days where i'm like i have to cut a lot out or i have to like completely change the edit i had in my mind and now it's like i'm just gonna do like a cheat i'm gonna go here and then i'm gonna just pan it to this guy pan that guy and then maybe i'll like cut somewhere else but i, I was cut in corners um but he would the way he worked is like it's same thing it was kind of really organic he would adjust if he had to adjust and and uh really just keeping that set light you know um i could think of a couple people you know that are really great directors but you know they just start getting really upset and and start yelling, you know. Um, but Koichi never was like that. Yeah, that's um, that seems like a kind of a Hong Kong thing, also maybe that he kind of pulled from Karata. Well, he, he or... just really, he, he just knew. I don't know. He just uh, it wasn't going to benefit him, I guess. Right. You know, um, because he always ended up. I mean, he was always really fast at shooting whatever it was. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I just I just really liked that about how he worked. You know? are, are you able to 
kind of piece the scene together. I mean, we we talked about this. You you see the scene, but is that a a very organic process for you? Does it come quickly? Is it is it easy for you to see all this stuff, or do you need to draw it out first? Do you need to write it first? How do you mean? Like if I had a scene that was written yeah, like, out, or... like an action scene. So you have you have a script, and then do you do you like to shot list, and that helps you imagine what the scene is going to look like, or do you read your scene and then you just imagine it and see it play out? How do you prefer to go about that, particularly I, I with imagine, the action scenes? I do uh, with action. Yeah, I kind of imagine it, um, and then uh, a lot of times I'll listen to music, you know, and and then and go, well, it needs to be longer. You know, um, it's going to happen. This is going to happen too fast or whatever it is. Um, but, uh, yeah, you can usually see it um, or how long it should be. Or, um, But that doesn't mean I, if I have time, I, I might even extend something. Or even on the day, and you probably know this too, it's like, you know, this actually might work better if I change the lens up, you know. Right. And, you know, so it, it really just depends on what it is. Um, I do feel like this last project I did... Um, I probably came up with more new things on the day than I normally would. Normally I would just shoot, like I shot a Western and I, yeah, I wrote it as well, but it was, everything was exactly how I saw it. And it was like, well, that's what we did. And that's what we got for the most part. Um, but this one, it was like, I, I don't think I can do what I thought, you know, cause we're running out of time. And so I'm just gonna have to adjust and, and make it work this way. Um. And then I actually even find like when I get in to the, you know, I'm in the box or the computer and I'm editing and I'm like, maybe that didn't work out the way I thought it did. Uh, and then I would spend a few, you know, hours just kind of like adjusting things and looking at it and going, ah, I can completely flip this edit from the way I thought. Um, I, I, one, one thing I had was there's in this one um, is I would see boom shadow throughout here or there, and I'm like, ah, that was a great take, but I can't use it now, you know, or something was wrong, you know, like, oh, I actually see a light in that one, you know, or whatever it is, um, and then had to make a, an adjustment, um, but, you know, that's just all part of it all. A lot of problem solving, you know. Another question, Gabby Michelle is asking, uh, what do you consider to be your greatest lesson learned as a person and as a creator since the start of your career? greatest lesson learned holy cow um oh man i don't know um maybe think on yeah. that we can come back to that at the end that might have been an end of interview question yeah <laughs> i mean i just feel like i don't, I don't know i you know because i feel like every single day or any time i'm working on something there is a new lesson that i've learned and it's just a thing where you're just like huh ah, you know, I feel like I'm constantly learning new things or ways to adjust or fix myself mm. or approach things differently. So there's not like one big thing where I'm like, oh, man, that changed everything. It's like a lot of things, you know, like um, I'm also really super critical about everything I do. So I'm always constantly thinking like, oh, I could have done that better. You know, um, that makes sense. So when it, when it comes to learning new things, um, are, are you better at learning new things now than you used to be? Oh, heck yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, usually, and it's like, like if I look at old school Power Ranger stuff when we shot, like, I didn't know what they were doing or where the camera was or what lens was there and what did what, you know? I'm like, I don't know what a, what's a 20, 25 mil? You know, what's the difference? You know, I didn't know any of that stuff. And then it was like, when I saw it afterwards, I was like, oh, gosh, that kick was not, I should have, like, extended more or something, you know? So you just kind of learn it and, and then you go, okay. Now I know, you know, and make that adjustment. And what about um, as you put on more hats, um, how do you, have you found yourself delegating more? And what's that yeah. process been like for you? Um, well, it's, it depends on what it is, right? So like a small or like a short, if you're make, doing a short, it's a lot easier to be like, oh, I can carry the props or I can, you know, handle the wardrobe or whatever, like little things is that you think, or you think they're little things until you get on a much bigger project and you've got like 50 actors and like, well, I can't, you know, I can't keep track of all this stuff. You know, what about continuity? You know, pay attention to that sort of stuff when you're on camera or whatever. So it's definitely, uh, I, I do now absolutely go like, ah, 
even even this last thing, I just didn't have the the funds to be able to bring as many people in as I, I wanted to to be able to handle those little little things. And I'm paying for it afterwards because I'm like, oh, I've got to spend extra time now in the edit to try to see if I can fix that, you know, um, and cut around a certain thing or whatever, you know, um, things that somebody would be somebody's job to be like, that's hey, that they're holding that cup in the wrong hand now or whatever. Right. Um, so little things like that, but even just getting food every day, you know, cause you, you're so focused on like, what's the next thing, what's the next thing we need to get to or memorizing my own lines or whatever it is. It's nice to have somebody else go like, Oh, we've already ordered food. It's coming in and out. I'm like, Oh, good. Glad you thought of that. Cause otherwise we probably wouldn't eat today. You know? Um, yeah, I, I so, had a few of those days on uh, death grip. I think. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's just one of those things that, you know, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I, but I do find sometimes, not always, but in some situations where I'm like, if I could have another me just doing that job, I feel like I could do it better than the person I hired, you know? And I'm not saying that's across the board. I'm just saying like, there are some times when I'm like, oh, I paid that person a lot of money, but boy, they're really not there like doing that thing, you know? Um, but you, f I, I mean, that's just, low budget high budget you just and then you just don't bring that person back you know yeah. you, just, uh -uh, you know but yeah. then you also find people that are like the opposite you're like i don't know where i found this person but they're amazing you know sound is like another thing just having somebody just doing sound so you don't have to go like i don't know i guess we're gonna adr this <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah that's sort of like that is one of those things of what, what would you I mean that's like such a like the achilles heel of indie oh, filmmaking yeah. where you think you can get away with just not paying for sound. And <laughs> for, yeah, there's probably someone that'll do it for free and hold a boom mic and all the sounds gonna be crap. And you're thinking, oh yeah, I can just ADR this whole thing without realizing how much time and money that's gonna take and how long that's gonna just push post out and then making that look, making that sound normal. When well, they gotta get a sound mixer, you're not gonna pay a sound mixer now. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. And then you have to have actors that know how to do ADR. And not make it sound like you're reading the book or whatever. You know, it's like you've got to like adjust the, you know, your presence. And, uh, you know, are you projecting? Are you supposed to be projecting? Are you supposed to be, you know? So there's a lot there, you know. <clears throat> yeah, you have a leg up in that. Um, as a voiceover. I, I now have an understanding of it. Yeah, for sure. Voiceover, uh, uh, yeah. Um, anything recently voiceover-wise um, of interest that you've worked on? About? That you can talk about, yeah. Um. Well, I could, well, Bleach is back. Um, and so that's, that's an anime that, you know, um, I, I was just, it was a great anime to be a part of, um, really liked the story. It kind of had an, a bittersweet end when they, they stopped and I was like, oh God, because it wasn't the complete story. The manga was still going. Um, so it's great to be able to come back in and, and then pick up on that. Um, and they just started releasing the, at least the sub, I think the dub should be coming fairly soon. But uh, that's not a big secret. People know that that's coming. Um, I, another one that came back was was Trigun. Um, so that came back, but in a different way. But it still came back. So it's neat to come back to like, that was like my first voiceover ever. And so for that to kind of get a new reimagining um, was pretty awesome as well. Um, yeah, and there, there's quite a few other things that I can't wait to start talking about. But yeah. I, you know, until... I can. You know, I'm just sitting around waiting. When you when you come back to these roles um, after however many years, is it is it? What's the process for coming back to the character for you? I I, I watch the older stuff um, because I know that that's what people have seen, um, and then you know there's a good chance that they're probably going back through it too, knowing that it's coming back. Um, so I want to kind of give them the right place for us to start back up. You know. Um, and then also just depends on, you know, what it like with Trigun. It's it, uh, it's it's pretty different. Like it's a little bit more serious. It follows the manga a bit more, um, but it's a little more real. So it was kind of neat to go into that and go, oh, okay, I've got to play this character a little more real. Like my feelings have to really be there in the in the voice. It's not over the top and goofy or too cartoony. And so that was actually kind of a. Uh, a neat thing to do because is is like the same character the same heart 
the soul of the story, but it's it's just a slightly different approach. Plus, it's like, you know, that was the first thing I ever worked on. So I'm a much better voice actor, you know, than I was when I started. So that was kind of neat to do. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ash Fangirl Lisa asks, what is the inspiration? <clears throat> what was the inspiration for your voice as older future Nobi in Stand By Me Doraemon 2? What was my inspiration? Yeah. Um, I don't know, really. The story just kind of led me to be where it needed to be. Um, I really like uh, the Doraemon stuff. Um, uh, just I just like the character, just you know, this kid that's super lazy or does all the wrong things. Um, it's it's a fun show, but whenever you come in and you get to do those the movies, they're a bit more serious, uh, and I don't know. They're they're just fun. Um, and uh, really, it, it, whenever I do any voiceover, I think, but I don't know. The inspiration really is the the project and and the story and what's in the story and what's what's happening to the character. Um, but I do also know, like the back of my head, I'm always thinking of how do I make this at least feel real for the the audience? You know, because if they can hear me, like. If I'm phoning it in, for example, they're going to be like, well, they'll tune out or they'll be like, ah, forget it. You know, so I need to make sure that, like, I feel like I'm that character in that space. Um, so th even just knowing the audience is going to be watching is inspiration, too, to, to, to keep, you know, keep it up, I guess. Is there, um, on the day when you, when you come in to do your voiceover or if you're doing it at home, whatever it is, uh, <clears throat> do you have a routine? before you start actually doing your work depends on the the show and the character some characters it <clears throat> i can just call up you know there might there's usually like a phrase or something that's earlier on when i first started working on it and then i i say whatever that phrase is and it's typically like a line maybe that i said that kind of gets me in the voice and half the time it's it's really just kind of saying their name um and then others, it just it really just depends. Um, Iron Blooded Orphans, it wasn't something that I needed to do, but the the guy was he was Orga was like a soldier, and I felt like in my mind I'm like, wow, man, he what did soldiers do? You know, they're they're always fighting. Maybe they're yelling over gunfire. And so whenever I would drive to work, which is like a forty five minute drive, I would shout out all the street signs and you know whatever. Like I was just shouting the whole way there. So whenever I got into work, I was kind of already a little raspy. So there may be like a hint of a texture in the voice. Um, and I, most people probably couldn't tell, but it, I could feel it more. So it kind of like made me feel more like that, you know? Um, and then there's other times where like I have to do like a young kid voice. And so I would probably, and depending on what, who the kid is, it's like, how clean does it need to be? Um, and then, so I might have like, I have a root, not really a routine, but I have like a set, uh, of like warmups that I might go through, you know? <clears throat> um well on camera stuff you it's you you know <laughs> so you really have to be that character physically as well um and so i don't know i do feel like for me, with voiceover, I still feel like I have to be that. Um, and it depends on the project. If it's like, you know, a comedy, then, you know, my director might be making jokes and that's fine. But sometimes if it's a serious thing, and most directors know they're not going to be busting jokes right before you're doing something. But I typically will turn down the lights and all. the only thing I see is my screen. So it, it feel, it, for me, it feels like I'm there and it feels like I'm in that space. So there's, for me as an actor, it's kind of, it's similar, but uh, I don't, actually, when I do on camera, I'm not thinking about the voice. Whereas, you know, obviously here it's it's all voice and it's where am I on the mic? You know, um, it's it's, you know, it, like how close or how far do I need to be in my shouting? And is this a, a thought filter? So I've got to be kind of up close or whatnot so when i'm doing on camera i'm not thinking about the voice really at all i'm just thinking about like where did i come from 
uh, where am I going? You know, what part is my character playing in the big picture? Um, and then like, where do I end, you know, and how do I get to that place? And where am I in that arc, you know, or am I a character that just is like this the whole time, you know? And when you're recording uh, vocals for music or if you're performing live, where does that fit in to, because that is a form of acting, isn't it? Well, I, I mean, well, I've, I, I've written the lyrics, you know, so I, I know usually what really inspired the song um, or the lyrics. So if it's like, you know, whatever it is, my brother passing, like it's like, I'm, well, I'm just there. That's just me. Um, that's just how I feel. Um, but then you also have to think about singing. It's also very technical too, you know, cause, uh, if I'm talking, I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying things, you know, and how, how are they come out, you know, but, but when you're singing, it's gotta be like the right key. You know? And, 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 and so I think, I you kind of find it really it feels a little more organic i think um because it's more it's more feeling when you're singing for me at least it's more uh, a feeling um and it and that's that's just in the booth but like uh if i'm like playing live it's it's very different because then you feed off the energy of the the crowd and the audience you know if they're really into it and then you just forget everything and you're just like i'm in this space and we're all one or whatever the song is and you are singing my lyrics and then i feel that and i'm like holy cow this is insane and then you just kind of like it's just like this energy you know in the room you know and then it could be the opposite too you know it could be like you're trying you're really you almost and, and that's the way it is usually if you're playing and the audience doesn't know any of your songs you almost have to cheerlead a little bit and try to get them into it so you you adjust your you're set so you've got a few songs in the beginning that are kind of upbeat, you know, um, so you kind of get them moving. And then once they're like, OK, I like that last song out of the five songs you played. And then uh, then you kind of like you kind of get them on board a little bit, you know, and then it's like, OK, now I can take you in a different direction emotionally, you know, and the tone of a song, you know, and then, then you, you know, you go there and then you, you kind of you really just try to it's. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but like you, you try to just sync up with your audience. Um, and it's different everywhere you go. Like I remember when we would tour, like for whatever reason, certain places like, you know, we go to Arizona and they were just instantly wanted to move, you know, and you're like, whoa, okay, here we go. And then there's other places where it's like, okay, these guys are not going to move at all. You know, so this is going to feel like a performance. Um, so, yeah. What I mean, have you found any of these? I mean, it's it's kind of a psychological skill that you're using with your audience that's there in front of you. I'm sure stand-up comedy works much the same way. Um, oh, yeah, probably. Do you, yeah. do you find yourself using any of these skills when it comes to acting for film or doing voiceover? In terms of, in terms of trying to, I mean, I guess it would apply more to live action. You mean like drawing on like uh like something that maybe happened to me personally to be able to tie into like the certain emotion? Yeah, or yeah. also even just acting um, off of somebody acting. else. Like if you like if you're if you have a cold oh, yeah. other actor, do you find yeah. that the oh, two I... skills kind of coincide somewhere? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same sort of thing. If you're working with other actors, then yeah, you're just yeah, you find it. And then sometimes that's what a rehearsal does is like, you're like, ah, that didn't feel right. Let's do it again. And then it's like, oh, there it is. That's it. Let's connect it on whatever little adjustment, you know? Um, so yeah, for sure. That can happen that way. Anime is very different though. Anime, you're typically in, and a lot of voiceover, a lot of games and stuff. You're not hearing the other actor, um, you know? And so you kind of have to like assume what, how they're saying it, you know? Um, and then, uh, you know, if you have a great director, they, they kind of already know where they are going to guide somebody and how the scene is supposed to play out. And so they might even adjust you and oh, actually they're going to say it like this, or the meaning is actually this, you know? Um, yeah. And so they're kind of more in control of, of the overall feeling, I think, of how everything connects, I guess. 
Are you primarily, when it comes to anime, are you primarily directed by American or English speaking directors? In most cases, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, there's oftentimes, not often, but uh, some of the time, there are producers that um, are are Japanese or of another language, um, and and they're usually they they might be sitting in on it to go like, well, actually, this is this is what this is saying, you know, in Japanese, you know, because sometimes things are translated and they don't actually come across the same way once they're translated, and so it's like, oh, okay, so that that's what that means. So this is, we should change the words, you know, so for it to make more sense to uh, a Western audience. So do you, do you actually get a little bit of creative freedom there? Sometimes, the depending on the project. Yeah. It depends on the pro like bleach. Yes. A hundred percent. They, they kind of, at this point, trust me, um, you know, if something, and, and I care enough, you know, to kind of know what's going on that, you know, um, not that, you know my director doesn't because my director does but it's like they typically just go like well you know you know the difference you know um reyna asks how do you maintain your voice since you've done quite a bit of dialogue on some of the animes you're, uh, that you're doing and also all the singing um <clears throat> well uh i don't know <laughs> don't talk so much Right. I mean, well, it depends because there are times when I, I work on a game or a character and the character just screams and, and, you know, especially on games, you know, and then it's like after a game session of just a lot of screaming, you, I just don't talk. I'm like, all right, well, you know, and I am you know, out there in my family. I'm like, hey, I'm, I, I can't talk, you know, for a little bit. I got to like restore this, you know, because, hey, maybe I've got another voiceover coming up or whatever it is. Um, and sometimes like on the weekend, whenever I go to a convention, you know, a lot of my characters, you know, that I've voiced in the past, they have some like phrase that they call it. And it's always like a shout, you know? And so people want to hear that. And a lot of times I'll do it, but sometimes I'm like, ah, I, I can't do that right now because I got to work Monday early. And if I do it now, then I'm going to, I'm not, I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of the voice, you know, and that's the thing that's going to be out there forever. <laughs> you know. Um, so sometimes I have to. You know, I could talk, but I, I right now I can't shout. Um, some people understand, not everybody. When you're doing conventions and you're meeting <laughs> hundreds, thousands of people, um, how long do you typically do a sitting at these? And what what is that like for you uh, inside? I mean, is it is it draining, or do you do you get a lot out of this? Um. <clears throat> Well, usually your day, you usually start, um, you're like at a table or something at like 10 o'clock. Um, and your day usually doesn't end until about like five or six. It could go longer. It just depends on what, if it's a convention or if it's like a shop. Um, so I've, I've, I've done 12 hour signings where I've just sat there for 12 hours. Um, and, and it, it may be, it, I, some people, I guess maybe an extrovert, like they energize off of other people. Me, I am an introvert, um, and uh, I I have to like decompress. Um, so it takes a little bit more for me to kind of be present. You know, um, I don't really. I mean, I don't want it to make it make it seem like I'm being fake in front of people because I'm not being fake in front of people. But it does take more energy for me to to stay present, um, and I don't know what that is. For me personally, I maybe mean, it's part of it's like insecurities, maybe, and me I originally. I'm just 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 kind of a shy person, um, and I don't want to say anything wrong or you know hurt anybody's feelings by just that uh, blurting something ridiculous. So there's like this kind of compression that's like self checking constantly. I think that's what it is really. Um, but uh, I do really enjoy meeting the fans of these projects, um, and part of that is I'm in the booth, I'm working on this thing, and I don't know. If they're going to like it, that's when I find out they like it, you know. It's kind of like when I've written a song and then I've go, I go and I play it live and I see somebody singing that song, then I have an instant connection with that person. Like, holy cow, you get it. You got that song. And so when I meet a person and they love Bleach or whatever it is or like that, I love that episode. When you, Then for me, I'm like, oh, yes, I've got an instant connection with that person, you know. And it, it does kind of like it's a, it's like the reward. It's almost it's like, you know, if you're. Like I've never done theater, 
really. So I think when you do theater, you know, they might cheer, you know, you get that instant, you know, like, Hey, you did great. Why well, cheering? Like, yeah, whatever. Right. Um, and so that's kind of the accolades, I guess, you know, um, but there, you gotta, you gotta self check there too. Cause you want to obviously keep yourself humble, you know, um, in those kind of situations because you could be like oh man they think i'm great but i'm really just a hack you know yeah i feel that all the time i think of that in my head like oh, i'm terrible i don't know i'm always constantly fixing and adjusting myself please don't look up to me i'm like you know i'm not I'm not perfect that, yeah. that's a really interesting point um because at times it can be very uh i guess a little bit unnerving when the expectations are so high yeah yeah you, you you do i mean i i feel that every time i go into the booth i'm like that's what i was saying before it's like i i can hear the audience behind me you know and it depends on the project too it's but it's like i can hear the audience you know and it almost feels like you better do it right <laughs> you know what i mean and that's and i think when i first started doing voiceover i wasn't really thinking about those things it was just like i was in the moment and enjoying it but now like all the time i'm like I, I will say something if something doesn't seem right to me. Like if the script doesn't seem right or a, or a piece of dialogue doesn't seem right, I'll say something because it's going to be my name out there. It's not going to be like, oh, the writer wrote it wrong or the director directed wrong. It's like, no, nah, it's it's my name that's out there. And I'm the one. And it happened to me before. I worked on a project <clears throat> where the where I did the voice of this character and uh, they wanted me to pitch him up higher and higher. And I'm like, well, I'm going to lose that range if I go too high and they're like yeah don't worry about it you know but then of course when the reviews came out they were like oh we love this anime except johnny bosh she was you know too high and whiny and after that i was like okay <laughs> yeah, i was gonna ask if there's any particular feedback that you remember that maybe that's definitely one of them took you up. okay yeah yeah because it was like i was told to do one thing and i remember thinking well this doesn't feel right and i don't think it sounds right but you're the boss, so I'm going to do it the way you tell me to. Um, and then when the reviews came out, generally people liked it. But there's, you know, it was like, except Johnny. And so once I saw that, I was like, I even said something. And I just felt like, oh, but you can't do anything. You can't be like, well, I told them, you know. No, it's like, it's out there, you know. It's just like even when I'm shooting this film that I'm doing, it's a low-budget film. And I'm constantly thinking – they're not going to care about it being a low budget film. Is it good or not? Period. You know? So you're thinking like, how do I make this not look like a low budget film? You know? Yeah. What? So compared to, you've talked about what you hear in your head when you're doing anime. Now, what are you seeing? What are you hearing in your head when you, for, you know, with regards to your audience, what are you hearing in your head as you're making your own films? What's that voice for the audience? When I'm yeah, doing what's that? that voice? That subconscious voice in your head when you're there's doing films? Hmm. There's a couple of voices, oh, multiple voices. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I I hear because it's it's almost like it's basically like the same voices I hear when I go to a convention. I liked this, or I didn't like this. And just to, um, just to be clear, these are not literal voices, right? You're not turning around seeing where that came. Just so that people know. Right. No, no, Johnny, no. Johnny, as far as I know, does not have schizophrenia. Right. Um, no, it's it's just... Uh, it's your conscience, it, almost. Right? It is. Yeah. It is. And, and you know, it's it's also me. It's, uh, it's really... It's also me just... Uh, I've always been more insecure about things, you know? And now that I'm I'm just i'm doing a, i'm out there now you know so it's like there's a lot of self-checking constantly um and some of that is backed by the things that i've heard people say or write about me or whatever it is you know um and so when i'm doing like even when i was writing it's like well what would they want to see you know do they want to see something sci-fi do they want to see a superhero thing do they you know um how can i you know, there are things that that I know that they like. Like, can I do a live action anime? Is that even possible? Like, what would that look like? So there's there's that kind of thing. You know, um, like how can I satisfy this this kind of fan? 
you know, how can I satisfy this kind? Because you can't satisfy everyone, you know, but how, what can I do that they'll be like, ah, oh, I know exactly what he was doing when he put that in there, you know? So the, it's kind of that, you know, it's like, I, I it's, I'm, I'm basically trying to reconnect with them, you know, and, and, and let them know that, hey, even though this is kind of a thing that I wrote, it's my own personal project, I still want you to be a part of it, yeah. you know? we're still connected in some way. So this is my like, thank you for being a part of whatever. Um, here, here's here's a little bit of that, that you're gonna only understand, you know, like this certain fan will understand this piece of this story, you know? Um, is that a challenge for you? Because you're you're going from, and you have a lot, I mean, you have a lot of sign of kind of these domains where you've got your anime, you've got your, your music, you've got your live action, you know, under other directors. Um, what of all of that then do you try and bring to your projects? Because like, if you were to have, if you were to take the YouTube algorithm and say, okay, Johnny Young Bosch, he's Power Rangers, these voiceover actors, and these, these animes, these, um, you know, motion capture games, uh, and then indie films, like how do I, how do I, as an algorithm draw a line? through all those things to indie films. I'm always thinking about that with my own stuff because when I did Tekken in real life, it sort of made everybody think like, oh, this guy's got a podcast? Like I thought he was just kicking around in a garage and like it was very difficult for people to like go from one to the other. Do you, um, do you ever find that uh, to be a challenge for you? Yeah, for sure. Even with my band, you know, like nobody, you know, I, I've, we've been doing it for a long time. We were I Shine once, now we're called Where Giants Fall. Um, maybe that was a mistake. People are like, well, now people aren't going to know who you are if you changed your name. They knew I shine. They don't know where giants fall. Um, but at the same time, I just, I, well, we, okay, if I just talk about my band for a second, you know, originally, I shine. Um, some people liked it. Um, and then still, most, I would say most of my fans have never heard of it, you know, or never heard that, or do, don't even know. Um, and And I know some of them, because they've said it to my face. They tuned in because they thought it was going to be ridiculous. Oh, this Power Rangers singing? Let's see what this is. Um, and so I know there's also that. Um, I think, I don't, I don't really think about it as far as like, how do I get them there? You know, it, it's more of like, well, this is another thing I do. Um, if they tune in, they might catch this little piece, this nod to them, you know. That's a great way of putting it because maybe a lot of us, we tend to fall back almost on satisfying a sort of algorithm out there. Like, how do you sell yourself? Like, oh, I've been doing this thing for so long. I'm a, you know, whoever it is. And it's like, well, how do I now sell myself as an artist to, to all these other people or, you know, as a you know musician or if you get into drawing or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe sometimes we are thinking too much about how, the algorithm sees us rather than just doing the best thing that we can possibly do. I, I mean, yeah, I, that's, that's what I, I don't think I could figure out the algorithm thing anyways. Uh, I know, I know some people that are like, I'm shooting this thing and it's going to be viral. And <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's, I don't know. Good luck with that, you know, and, and maybe it did happen or maybe it doesn't, you know, it's like, I, I don't know if you really should think about that really. Um, because then maybe, I don't know. The purpose behind it all is lost. You know, I think you just got to kind of be yourself, you know, um, and then people are going to like that or not, you know, because how long do you want to be fake? <laughs> you know, you just got to do your thing, do the best you can. There's always going to be somebody out there that just doesn't like you, you know? Yeah. 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 And, 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 and there's going to be people like, for instance, there's going to be somebody like you have no business doing podcasts there's gonna be people that say that oh yeah my my own my own friends sometimes are like oh, this is a nerdy this is nerdy crap like, all right well don't right. don't watch it you know <laughs> we can watch the other nerdy crap on my channel um <laughs> well but i mean that that also brings up uh the question of like what have you discovered about yourself having done all these things do you find that um as you take on each new endeavor are you do you find yourself kind of split between two things or do you find them or do you try and like put them into a hole within your own uh, within your own personality i guess you could say how do you mean do you mean am i distracted by my own yeah so, like, for example if you were to do a new 
musical album. Uh -huh. um, is there a part of you then that feels like you're conflicted over, okay, well, I'm, I'm trying to do this thing over here, but I'm also trying to bring this part of me over to this music. Do you find that there's a conflict there or do you find a way to sort of bring those things together? Uh, with music, it's um, like I could sit down, like I can come up with something, right? right now I can maybe come up with a couple things or whatever um, without inspiration I can just kind of make some things up um, but usually with the music I kind of like it to it, it I don't know how to explain it it kind of like I just feel like a thing like like there was a not too long ago I was working on our next album um, just before I started working on this film um, and so I have a ton of songs and then once I started to go into the film, I was like, oh, well, I should start, maybe I should make up some music for the film so I can kind of see where I'm going to, you know, how I'm going to do some of the action or pace things out. So then I just shifted over to that. And so now, yeah, the album's kind of been pushed aside a little bit. Um, and then I just recently went back to it because I was writing an intro for something else and I was looking, listening through and I was like, oh, actually. And then so that kind of like, it's all, I don't know. I don't think about it. But I think also it's because I'm not on any deadline. Hmm. It's like my own thing. So it's like, well, it's going to come out when it comes out, you know. Um, it's it's a little different than, like, I, I, I'm I getting paid to do this. So right, I mean, like if you're on a tour a tour contract or something, right? Yeah. And the, the band, like, it's not like I have, like, this insane following that's constantly demanding more music. You know, I've got like maybe a hundred fans. Like I have more than that, but it's like there's probably only a hundred that are like, can you give us more music? You know, yeah. um, and not that I'm not hearing them, but it's like I kind of want, it needs to feel like the right time, yeah. you know. Um, otherwise, it is me just kind of like doing it and kind of making it happen, um, you know. And then, you know, something will happen in life and then it's like, wow boy, I just feel I need to write something, you yeah, know? Yeah. It's a little therapy in that too. Simon Leach asks, um, what's your writing process for when you're working on songs and movies, respectively? Is there a difference? Oh. Sure is. So for movies, yeah, well, it, it um, well, what what's the scene about, really? You know, it kind of depends on what, the scene is um you know if it's an action thing then yeah it's something a little more upbeat um it's only recently where i've like reached out to some friends that i you know i'm like hey i, I feel like some kind of heavy metal thing in here and i might have something but i'm like we do this um it just depends on what it is you know what's what's the feeling behind it like what do i want the audience to feel um that's, you know, that's really where I start. It's like, well, what do I want them to feel? Do I want them to to be pumped up and kind of like, yeah, or is, does it need to be intense? Like, you know, it's more about feeling, I think, for me, when I write. It's, you know, what, what do I want to feel in this flashback, you know? Does it need to feel like they're soul searching? You know, then then I, you know, I grab my guitar and I, I, I pl play something and I, reverse it all reverse all the notes or whatever you know I throw a ton of reverb and delay on it and I'm like oh, okay that doesn't even sound like a note anymore that just sounds like I don't know a sound that makes me feel a certain way what music do you listen to besides your own I don't actually listen to my own music <laughs> um it's pretty good you should try it <laughs> uh I listen to a lot of score, actually. I listen to score, and um, it just kind of depends, really. Sometimes I tune into older stuff. I don't really listen to a whole lot of new stuff. Um, it's more stuff from the 80s or 90s or grunge rock, um, maybe some classic rock, uh, and then just a lot of score. Like, a lot of times I'll, I'll be watching a trailer or a film, and I'm like, this, I feel something, and then I'm like, ah, oh, it's the music. You know, it's the music in tune with the picture has really drawn me into this. And then I'm like, I seek out that score. Who wrote this? You know, what, what do you uh, what do you think are some of the greatest action film scores? Great. Uh, Once Upon a Time in China, you know, 
there's uh i mean you, you know the music if you've seen the movie yeah immediately you know <laughs> yeah exactly um you know it's it those are the ones is where it's like oh i, I just know that the music's in my head right now um i've I also recall just having that soundtrack just like when it with a in a like a walkman or something and just playing that over and over again just when i'm working out or just walking through a park and it's like really kind of cheesy when you think about it but you know you yeah I'll that th- one for sure i'll yeah. throw uh i'll throw takeshi katano's films into that hat um yeah and uh but it, interesting too you mentioned um once upon a time in china uh a lot of the time hong kong films at least before 2000 um the the soundtrack happens between the action there's very little music during fight scenes um that seems to have changed they seem to do a much more kind of hollywood style music is like pushing the action Mm -hmm. a lot of the time Mm -hmm. um i don't know i was wondering if you ever noticed that (laughs) because you when you score films you score i mean just like in death grip we score the entire thing right Mm -hmm. the fight has music behind it yeah well, I mean, I'm thinking about Matrix now. I remember Matrix definitely had like its own like feel. Yeah, Matrix the- Reloaded with uh, yeah. Juno Reactor. Yeah, that was incredible. And I, I, I actually talked to him and asked him about that because I, I said, how do you, how do you make a, how do you make a, a, a score for a fight scene still sound really good and sound like a rock song away from the fight scene, right? Because you listen to some fight scene soundtracks that follow the fight and, and it like alone they don't quite they're, they're not they don't cohere very well right because you just gotta kind of fit it <laughs> right and uh he had a really interesting story about that yeah, yeah so we even like uh as you're saying that i was like oh yeah like the old school the the, the first mortal mortal combat yeah mortal combat da, 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 you know uh, yeah okay they're about to fight <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the big tell um well, uh, we're uh, we have a new segment um, on the uh, live show uh, that I uh, Johnny is going to be the first <laughs> first victim of this uh, experimental section. It's called "How You See It," and uh, we've that. we've picked some uh, we've picked some action scenes beforehand. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch them, uh, probably not entirely. We'll watch pieces of them together, and that way everybody can kind of see how you think and how you see action scenes. And we decided on, you know, some classic action scenes. We have some new ones. We also have some things that you've worked on too. Um, might not get through everything. It depends on your, your schedule. Um, but uh, we'll get through as much as we can. Um, so I should talk over these. Then. Absolutely. We should MST 3k these things to the best of our ability. And uh, I was thinking we, we could start with, uh, we, were t- we were just talking about once upon a time in China. And yeah, I figured okay. I'd pull that one up. So this is the finale from uh, Once Upon a Time in China, Part 1. Jet Li is fighting uh, Yen Shi Quan. Um, Johnny, when you watch, when you first saw this, wh- what what did you think when you saw this? I had to rewind it and watch it again. Um, I was, I had a, I had a bootleg of it. When you see the the the, the wire work, um, yeah. w- I mean, was that the first time you had seen something like that? Um, I feel like I've seen wire work before, um, but I don't I don't know why it just uh, I don't know I just liked it, <laughs> and part of it was the music. I was like, yeah, I like this music behind it. Uh, this stuff is good. I like that stuff. Yeah. I'll I'll just give a little plug here. We uh, we go back and we look at uh, Jet Li's face when he's doing this really cool kick combo. That is Hong Yan Yan, um, not Jet Li. Not trying was to dig on Jet. Was it after he hurt his hip or something? Right? Didn't he? I think he had an injury on this fight. Yeah. Uh, but Hong Yan Yan was his double. He became Ghostfoot in the later Once Upon a Time in China. Uh, are you talking about Hong Yan Yan getting injured? No, no, uh, Jet Li. Jet Li, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. You see a pad there. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> well, wait. So, wait a minute. Was this thing actually iron then? 
I wonder if they... that's a good question. Actually, I mean, maybe it was pretty heavy. Though. Yeah, that might have been a legitimate. All that fuller's earth or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> helps with the impact. <laughs> yeah, dust. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, here we'll shoot forward a little bit. We'll get to the kind of craziness. Um... I mean, also it's like the choreography. You know, like all the ladders and stuff. Like they had to come up with this, like this whole thing. You know, um, it's like a dance. Do you think they pre this? No. <laughs> no. No, I don't think so. Yeah, Do you they, have any? They didn't, right? This was no. like before. This was like, they just showed up. They probably didn't have like hardly any idea. They probably, I don't even know if they had it all built. It's like, we need extra ladders. When did you first see this? Were you, um, in your, in your career, what were you working on? Man, I don't know. It, I uh, maybe I'm trying to think. It might have been like. I'm trying to remember if it was like I was at home, in Texas, or if it was like early Power Ranger days. It could have been early Power Ranger days. The reason why I think Power Ranger days is because I watched it a lot. Then, I even would listen to the music, on my Walkman, sitting in my trailer. Yeah. <laughs> right before going out to shoot some action scene. <clears throat> yeah i mean this is quite a feat uh the the ability to do these uh these gags that's a flat look at that, that that's not even a ladder though you see that it's a uh, it's flat on the bottom so they they had some workarounds the, right there you can see a gap but yeah where you're standing yeah yeah, yeah the part where he actually walks on looks like they, they covered that up we're gonna we're gonna destroy this fight for everybody <laughs> um, did you ever get those shoes I remember picking up some of those. Uh... Yeah, yeah. We everybody had. They yeah, these, apart so easy. They, they, they did not last. Uh, yeah, we did get a, them wet. Forget about it. Yeah, we did a feature film called Immortal, and we bought shoes like that. I, yeah. And we bought the. You know, we got. I think they looked. You know, they were exactly like that. Might have even been, been the same lady in Chinatown selling them. I don't know. And yeah, they ripped apart immediately. <laughs> I actually remember going to Chinatown to pick some of those up. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's a great fight. Uh, we won't we won't go uh, much more in. I thought we'd pull up uh, Drunken Master Two next. Um, oh, there we, go. yeah. And uh, same character. Yeah, same character. Um, not as many wires. There's one right, right there. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, this movie's pretty wire free. <clears throat> Dude, this this movie though, after I saw this, I was like, holy cow, like. How, first off, how did he think up all this stuff, you know? And look at the angle. Like, just that. He had the angle up above so you could see that that hand exchange, you know? That kip-up thing, that, that was a wire. When I first saw this, I think I, I had what was probably the equivalent of going from, from, uh, going from cigarettes to methamphetamine. <laughs> I felt like because I had seen this so early in my sort of you know Hong Kong fandom days, and I, I think I'd seen one Jackie Chan movie. I saw Rumble in the Bronx. I thought, oh, this is great. I'm gonna look up the best Jackie Chan movie of all time. I got this one, and, and you I saw this. Yeah, and I and I, I found this one it was thirty bucks for a VHS, and uh, and I watched it, and I came away a little bit depressed because I had a feeling that it would never get better than this, and, and in some ways it never did. Yeah, this this has got like, I mean, it just felt like it hit all the beats, you know, like there's like even this. And then what he goes, he uses his nose later. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. When you're, um, when you're watching all the shoe leather, right. The, the combat, what do you look at? Do you look at one character? Do you look at them both? Um, are you looking for moments when they're doing exchanges? There's, I don't, you know what? That's a good question. I, I, uh first the usually the first pass is just kind of experiencing it you know um and it's then because i'm often going oh that was cool what made that cool you know like oh is it the angle i could see his whole body when he did that rather than like the camera moving around you know like this this is shot to like showcase the fight you know like it may not be even like really difficult things that they're doing but the way it's shot just uh, highlights whatever the action is like that right there. Just the movement of him rolling towards like if you didn't move that camera. Yeah. You know, most of these shots are on tripods also. Um, 
I don't know if this fight has any handheld. There's a, there are a few dolly shots. But for the most part, Jackie would just put it on a tripod and let it sit there. You know? Very kind of conservatively shot. Yeah. You know, I think what I also liked about this film is that he does a lot of the some of these other the moves that he does in the final right here right <clears throat> he does it earlier in a fight but not as amazing or it's like uh do you, you know what i'm talking about that earlier scene when he does it yep. and then like you see him do it here and it's like oh he, he used it in the right way or something right yeah, it's like, exactly it's almost like it's like telling a joke and it kind of comes full circle right there's a satisfaction in it like ah oh, he succeeded Mark Houghton talked about this fight. Um, he was on the uh, the action team. La Galeron, who directed the movie, um, he was on their action team and uh, talked oh, yeah? about yeah. And he, he it's really interesting episode. It's an earlier action talks podcast, and uh, and he talked about how his team is basically gone for this scene. This is the one that Jackie where Jackie basically took over and um, La Galeron walked away. Um, and Jackie had a very different idea of what drunken boxing should be, but. All of those gags were set up by uh, Lao Galarong's team, and uh, that's why the the fights earlier on in the in the movie are so different than this one. This is a Jackie Chan fight, right, one hundred percent. But the fights earlier in the movie are this kind of interesting blend between Jackie Chan style and kind of Shaw Brothers, very kind of like nuanced martial arts style, you know. I recommend it if anybody hasn't watched it. Um, also, just like his his acting inside the fight too, you know. Yeah. That uh, that dust, it helps. Stand here just watching this. Um, let's uh, let's move on. All right, I could watch that all, all day. Right. I we could just keep watching that one. Um, let's pull up some uh some things that you've done. Um, okay. I have Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie. <laughs> okay. And uh, and I'm just gonna scan through this real quick, and maybe we'll go oh, to the uh. Maybe we'll go to the finale. Uh, oh, skip like a, you pro, uh, Maybe the... Let's see. Uh, there's a fight earlier on when we lose our powers. Maybe that one. That's like is, is it the one with the Amazon? There you are. No. Well, this, this stuff, I did my stunts in that one because my double broke his leg. Um, but they wouldn't allow me to do... A lot of things and some of the things i suggested to do they gave to somebody else mm. yeah sorry this one this one i did not before prepare. that oh yeah yeah so oh no um actually yeah go before all this this is there's nothing here before this um, yeah like just... before the, there's like a construction site so it's earlier gotcha quite a bit earlier okay yeah is it this uh, one going yeah before that well we do a civvy fight where we're in civilian is wardrobe this, is this it right here yeah, this is basically it. Okay. See, that was something right there. Um, I didn't know that the camera was just like looking at I didn't know it was gonna, not going to follow us. I did like a backflip off of that thing. <laughs> and it was like, oh, yeah, we didn't see it. So you're just going to jump. No, look, look right there. Oh, yeah, yes, you can see it. Hold on. There it is. You can see yourself through your backflip. <laughs> the next cut, I'm like landing yeah. completely. Watch. There, right there. You're doing your backflip. Back, yeah. 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 There it is. <laughs> like this. I'm like, yeah, okay. Whatever. <laughs> That's one of those things where it's like, well, I don't know where they had the camera. I just did the thing. I thought that they were I thought they were following us. Did they shoot multiple cameras on this? Um, I looks feel like, like they did. Looks okay. like some coverage shooting in there. Yeah. Is that you again? Yep. Yeah. That's I did my stuff in this one. Um, and was this Koichi? No, this? this wasn't Koichi. This was uh, Jeff Amata was mm. doing this one. Yeah, like Pruitt. Jeff Pruitt was here for some of it, and then I don't know what happened. I, uh, and then Pruitt was gone, and then uh, Jeff Amata came in, and we we did this fight. It's kind of interesting watching this because that's you you're seeing four of the six main actors doing their own acrobatics. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, well, this everyone did their own their own action on this. Oh yeah. Yeah, everyone here did because you know, like they they were gymnasts, and <clears throat> I wanted to do so much more. <laughs> But when you look at this compared to something new, I mean, I hate to be one of these people, but... I threw in this right here. <laughs> I was like, I got something different to play in here. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I look at, say, a new TV show with, uh, for kids, for example, um, I don't know, maybe you know, like, are, they, are they casting for martial art actors who are able to do acrobatics still? Or is that sort of... Beside the point now. Uh, I know for a while, they, uh, after us, they 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 didn't. After us, it was like, oh, they just had the stunt guys do it, you know? Um, I, but then I think somewhere along the line, they were like, you know what? We should probably get some people that do know how to do stuff. Um, you know, because they're like Yoshi and some of those guys that actually know how to do stuff. Um, I don't know when they decided to go back to it I, I don't know if it's still that way um I, I and i've met those guys from the new season i, I don't know if they're martial artists or not actually now who's in the suits here these these are these suits right here are are doubles we shot some of it um and then yeah so we shot it so many different ways we actually shot a bunch of stuff like, a, I mean, we shot so much stuff, but like where the helmets were different, um, like the visor wasn't there or they painted our mouth silver. Um, but I think most of what was on here is, is our, uh, doubles in the suits here. Um, like Danny Stalkup did my stuff in here. Um, there's, there's things that were cut out too, like, um, uh, my, my helmet, like there, uh, like Rocky's helmet has like this, uh, where he can, I don't know, there's like his visor changes and he can see in the dark or whatever it is. Um, but then mine, like the, the ears on the, uh, Mastodon open up. So like, I was supposed to be able to hear better and like, you can see it, like they leave it in there, but they never, um, they never really address it. Like the helmet becomes wider at some point in here. I don't remember exactly where. <clears throat> what is it like? For them fighting in these suits well th we wore them as well so just knowing that like i mean you're sweating in these things they're supposed to have fans in these uh helmets but they didn't really help that much so you know and there's no air they, so they're just sweating crazy um and then danny who did this right here was like you always do side flips so i'm gonna do a side flip thing so he he actually paid attention to the things that I did and tried to make the movement somewhat like me. Um, and there, like, a lot of, like, I had a, I actually had a weapon, um, but they took it away and gave it to someone else. And then so Danny's like, don't worry, I've, I've got you. I'm going to make it, this kick look special. <laughs> um, so he helped me out. Was, your you know, weapon, what was your weapon supposed to be? This one right here. Oh, <laughs> silly string. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> but after, afterwards, I was like, oh, yeah, that, that doesn't look as cool. Never mind. I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad we did the kick. <laughs> All right. I noticed that it uh, seems like you're able to kick to the head in this one. Yeah, we were. Not like the uh, series. Yeah. The film, we were allowed to do it. Yeah, see, that's kind of bonkers, doing that in a suit. Yeah, no, these, everyone here is amazing. Now, are they, I mean, are, <clears throat> these are not the Alpha Stunts guys. These are the American... Actually, they did have some Alpha Stunt guys in here. They had a, a mix. Oh, okay. It, uh, some of them were, they were the these uh, Ooze guys. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. the suit actors were actually the suit actors from the show. Mm. Uh, like, this is he in. Yeah, some they, they, uh, they, Once Upon a Time in China kicking there. Yeah, totally, right? Very cool. Yeah. Some good fights, man. Oh, but it was too obvious he was on a wire. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's change it up and um, <clears throat> let's uh, let's let's watch something that we did together. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, we uh, we did this little scene in Death Grip. Yeah. Uh, the bathroom, right? Yeah. yeah, it's called the bathroom fight. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's the only toilet humor in the movie. I'll skip forward. Yeah, the story is that uh, 
Johnny and his uh, and his cronies are looking for a uh, a very valuable coin in a museum, and my character is a curator, basically. I know he's a caterer there, um, and uh, my autistic brother. It's kind of a Rain Man story. Manages to get a hold of the coin, and he shows me. Yeah, but to see this oh, scene right yeah. here is actually pretty important. Yeah. Um, because you're in this bathroom, you break the thing, um, and then you do this bit right here where you can't really hear it right now, but yeah, the I'll toilet, yeah, yeah, flushing and whatnot, like at the slightest movement. So it's a very sensitive toilet sensor. Right. Like if you didn't do this, then the whole gag that we do later is like the, there's no tension. You know, so you're setting it all up right here. Yeah, this is a very Pink Panther kind of style, where you know, the idea, of course, you have to set it up, but it takes time, right? Mm -hmm. You have something I can use as a coin. <laughs> That's the most valuable coin in the world. <laughs> All you do is drape some toilet paper over that thing. You know? That's true. No, every time, man, in the airports is <laughs> that's a Tyrian shekel. And my brother, being uh, you know the uh, the autistic brother, um... I think you broke the toilet. <laughs> We built this bathroom in the warehouse where we shot basically the entire movie. Um, you can kind of tell that it's, kind of, it's a little uh, bit ramshackle when I now that I look at it, but because you, cause you made it. and you broke the toilet. Uh, do you do you remember when um, when do you remember this day? When we did this yeah i think so i remember it um um i don't remember us really rehearsing though we didn't really rehearse a thing did we no i didn't um I didn't this think... is more like we just kind of we're gonna do this next we kind of had like the idea the story of it yeah oh, i think we we kind of walked it out because when you first showed up we I think the first day you showed up, we did this. This is the first thing we did. And uh, it was just kind of this cold entry where it's like, okay, we're um, doing this, you know, we've never met before, you know, warming up to each other. And uh, I think that this helped break the ice, I think. I think it was a good choice. Because it's such a goofy scene. <laughs> this is the only scene that, because um, originally this whole movie was a comedy. And this was a very like, important piece. Uh, important scene in the movie and this is the one comedy scene that remained and it's the one that people remember <laughs> i should have made a comedy should have made the whole thing a comedy but shoulda woulda coulda it is what it is now yeah i, I do like this scene though <laughs> I feel like this has been I, I i feel like i got inspiration from something doing this i, I can't remember what though it might have just been pink, pink panther movies i'm not sure <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh <laughs> I can't remember if we came back and reshot anything cuz we No, I don't think so. I think so, yeah. No, we this was all then. We shot all this uh on the day, I believe. Um, yeah, because even the stuff afterwards, um, I don't remember if you told me, it, I, I went, when we go through the wall, not the uh, stalls, right. but I remember you saying like, I need to go through the wall or something like that, or like whatever happens, we need, we need, we need to keep going, keep acting, keep, uh, the action or whatever. Um, I remember there's something like that, you know, cause I, I remember feeling like I, I had to continue, um. When I felt like something wasn't a hundred percent the way it was supposed to be, yeah. even that, like we knew we had to break that. Right? Yeah. You wanted to break everything in this thing, I think. 
Yeah, it, because we we put it all together, and I knew that the. Oh yeah, this is the part where you had to. That's it. That was it. Yeah, we're supposed to go through the thing, but yeah. you didn't. Right? Yeah, the first time I didn't. Yeah, and then she just hit me again. I think I told you in mid take to just hit me again. <laughs> Somehow nothing hit Nathan when he's sitting on that toilet. I don't know how that how that worked out, but it did. Um, I have a funny story too about um, when uh, let's see, it's the uh, I think it's the first shot where um, no, it was uh, where was it where we where the mirror breaks? The um, yeah, this one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this mirror breaking. We had the stupidest idea for like how to break this mirror. Let's see if we can see it. Yeah. Yeah, it was the stupidest idea for how we did this. Uh, we found a nail gun <laughs> at this warehouse. And we decided, okay, when we shoot the gun, we'll have Nathan off camera a little bit and fire a nail from the nail gun <laughs> at the mirror. And it turns out nail guns don't go straight. Um, the nail spins through the air wildly and they don't fly very fast. I don't know how we ended up breaking it. I think we just ended up throwing a rock at it. <laughs> <laughs> but the first 15 takes are us stupidly shooting a nail gun uh, at this mirror. <laughs> um, and then I think it was uh, immediately immediately after this, because you came for about a, I think you came for a week? It was something like that. Yeah. Did, I, did I do a split thing or no? I think you did no. a split thing, because you came was back, it? you came back later, yeah, you came back later. Um, and uh, we did the finale, and that's when I got injured. Right. Yeah, yeah. Your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same day that you were, like, cramped up like crazy, too. Yeah, powered through it. Yeah. Got it all done. <laughs> uh, you got some good fights in that, though. You got some really good fights in Well, that. thanks for being part of it, man. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's check out a new project, one that you're not involved in. Um, this is one that... Um, this is one that Johnny picked, uh, Sub Zero versus Scorpion. And uh, yeah, I actually haven't seen the movie, but when you were like, pick something new, I just kind of like, I just punched in fight scene. I was like, oh yeah, I didn't, I haven't watched this movie yet. So we can uh, let's see, let's, we'll get to the we'll get to the meat of the fight. Here it is. So Scorpion is being played by uh, Hiroyuki Sonata, and Sub Zero is played by Joe Taslim. I assume they're using stunt doubles here. I could be wrong, but probably for the most part, you know, not that part, obviously. Like a good, like, uh, like he knows how to do stuff, though. He knows. I mean, it, yeah, it could just be him the whole time, if they allowed it. Right. When you watched this, uh, what stuck out to you? Um, I didn't watch it all the way through, uh, yet, so. What are you seeing when you when you watch a an action scene like this? It's a Mortal Kombat fight. It's live action. It's martial arts. It's violent. What are you seeing? Um. Well, why do you put the mask back on? <laughs> Died the double, probably. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um. Things like that. No. All right. Let's see. Uh, if we look at this, I'm like, okay, that's cool. He made the thing out of ice, but how's it so strong? Um. Then. That's kind of cool. That's kind of that's definitely Mortal Kombat. There's a lot of cuts here. Yeah, they shot this coverage style most likely. Uh -huh. There's there's a lot of these things in my. Something looked weird there. This part. Hang on, something felt like a, a cut. That enter that enter was very strange. Now they overlap, they do a lot of the overlapped kind of editing when you have a big moment, like launching that, that's three different shots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Which, which can work for, you know, moments like that. <clears throat> it, it can work just fine. But then sometimes you wonder when they're doing the, uh, when they're doing the yeah. action, there's a lot of cutting. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> interesting yeah <laughs> it would have been cooler i think if you hit him yeah <laughs> instead of hitting a statue that felt slow to me 
felt like the camera was moving too slow. You think at times like this when, you know, they are choreographing this so that they can do it as a master, maybe, I mean, maybe they thought they would cut that up. And then the yeah, I mean, like, like all the, the guys that are doing the fight, I think they're doing everything right. Yeah. Like it looks really good, you know, yeah, it's not bad. It's, it's definitely, you know, the, I mean, they're, they're either cutting, adding more edits to make it seem more intense or, or, you know, or you know, distract you a little bit from something. Wait, why? Oh, there's somebody in there. Oh yeah, the story. Yeah, there are people in these in the MMA cage here that are like frozen in the walls. Yeah, the performers are really good. Yeah, I think yeah. that the you know if I if I were to give one critique of this, um, it would just be that the the filmmaking didn't always line up with their talents. You know, I'd agree with that. Um, and then there's there's also you know I'll, I'll back it up real quick and I'll just point out one thing that i i notice a lot about scenes like this is that when you have um when you have weapon fights uh what will happen a lot of the time is when one weapon gets disarmed um uh, let's see i think it, i think he loses his uh does he lose his, lose his sword here no he doesn't lose it here but Well, I'm kind of skipping around now, but basically there's this cliche that happens a lot of the time with uh, action films where when a weapon gets disarmed, you very quickly have to disarm the other guy's weapon as well. Yeah, yeah, so that you can go to hand to hand. So we can go hand to hand, yeah. And it's so maybe that's in the script, you know. Uh. They start with swords and then the swords get disarmed and then they go hand to hand. And then it just kind of begs the question of, well, if you manage to disarm a weapon using your weapon and then that guy disarms your weapon, then what good was it even having a weapon in the first place? <laughs> yeah, it's just like when you, fights like this, it's, I mean, this is the way you do it. You know, you have like, I don't know, five beats and then you go big stunt, you know? Um, yeah. Like this, this is all working for me. I'm like, yeah, it's cool. I don't know the story. Um, there's probably more. That look at that. That you was a nasty was, stun. That, that that was that's one of those things where you go, oh, okay, that guy really went. Look at his leg. Oh, there, yeah, yeah. It actually looks worse when you just watch, see it the first pass. That don't look good, man. Yeah, but I, I for my first thought was like, did he land on it? Oh, backwards? I see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, still, yeah. It's like, Ooh. oh, yeah. That's, that just sucks. All right, but that's. That. I mean that that I'm like, oh yeah, there you go. That that stunt guy did it. Yeah. Nice job, oh, stunt man. Good job. They um, all did good. All right, let's pull up uh let's pull up one more. This is one that you uh recommended. The Devil May Cry Devil May Cry four, Dante versus Nero. It's cool mocap stuff, yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, just talk us through Okay, yeah, let's see. Um <clears throat> All right, so we're obviously um you know, none of this is there. <laughs> there's just cameras all around the room. And uh, there's there's basically this area that's uh, like I'm probably sitting on a, just a, a bench or, or boxes or something behind me so I can have my armrest. I don't remember exactly. Um, it could even be like mats. Part of the experiment here was, you know, trying to watch trying to watch action and movement through your eyes. So when you are, yeah, so when you're watching something like Devil May Cry 4, for example, your own projects, um, what are you looking at when you watch something like that? Uh, usually, did it work? Um, you know, it's like, because I didn't, you know, cut it or anything. It was like, I was just like there doing whatever it was. Um, so... You, any the first time through is like does it do what it's supposed to do whatever the scene is the fight you know does is it satisfying um like i i shot this film last year and i um i wasn't even supposed to do the action but through all these various things that happened i ended up having to shoot it um 
and thankfully I had some time. And so we had like a couple days and so I shot it and then I'd cut it at night, you know, what we shot. Um, cause you know, it's digital now. So I could get all the footage and I'd cut it together real quick and I'd go, huh, that works except for this, you know? Um, cause it was a, it was a strange thing because I had, I had the, the stunt double, but then my actor, they kept saying, well, you're going to have them, you know, but then it was like, no, you're not going to have them. So then I was like, oh, okay. So I got another six hours. What am I going to do? I, I shot everything I needed to get. And I was like, well, I guess I just need it because I was in the fight, you know, I'm like, well, I guess I'll just feature myself more. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, went and did that, just kind of shot more of myself. And then, um, you know, as I cut it together, um, I got to see like, okay, I just need a big thing here. Like, you know, you know, when you're watching a fight, it's like, I need a big uh, action piece here. The other thing too is like, well, like when we watch that Mortal Kombat thing, there's a lot of cuts, but those guys were great. Like they were actually good, you know, um, st stunt guys. Um, they're good action actors. And so they didn't really need that many cuts, you know, um, whereas I was working with like my stunt double was great you know and and I, I mean i knew how to do things but then my actor was 70 and he's not a martial artist so i'm going to have to cut this thing up like i can't like have like these long takes like originally that was the thought is that like you know try to get like six to eight beats before making a cut but it's like that's not going to happen um and so i am basically i as i shot the fight with myself in the double i left like where I could see the double's face, you know, I'm like, well, this is the shot I need to replace. And so I knew it's like, Hey, I just need, you throw a punch and then you make a look and then you make a move. And so I knew exactly how long I had, um, in this small amount of time. I don't know if I uh, answered the question. Or if I just went off on a tangent. Well, yeah, I mean, when you're, yeah, you're just, you're talking through the, your reasoning as to how you shoot things versus how you're, seeing that in something like Mortal Kombat. Um, but then in something like Devil May Cry, the amount of editing that they use, is that is that just the style that they're going for? Style. Yeah, that's definitely Yuji Shimomura's style, um, the way he he cuts things. Uh, and um, a lot of big tricks, a lot of uh, spins and things like that. Um, it's definitely a style. His style. Like, uh, you know, like when you watch Koichi stuff, he's got his style, you know. You watch that, like even even well, even the the actor who's doing like Jet Li, when you see him move, it's like that's Jet Li doing it, you know. Obviously, you could tell when his double's in there, but when he's when you see him throwing the kick or him doing the move, you're like that's Jet Li, you know. That's that's his his thing. That's how he moves. Um, yeah, Jet Li has a very special kind of way of moving that is very hard to replicate. <clears throat> yeah. Um. Yeah. The way he runs too, actually. <clears throat> and I, 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 when I did a broken path, I, I screwed up my knee. Actually, I screwed up my knee in a uh, Devil May Cry. Um. And then we shot um, Broken Path, and then my knee was still kind of like wonky. Um. But there's a scene where I'm running towards the barn. Um. And I remember thinking, I look like I'm running like Jet Li, you know, because I had like a bum knee, you know, and I'm like, God, that must have been like he's got that that hip thing or whatever it was that happened. <clears throat> yeah, he kind of has that unique run because of, um, I mean, he did have a leg injury before Once Upon a Time in China also, I think. It goes way mm -hmm. back, but they said he would never, uh, they said he would never kick again. Uh, Not exactly true. Showed them, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think usually when I watch a fight, I'm not really thinking, I mean, well, you can't help but think like, how did they do it? Or why did they do it? But usually it's, it's the experience. Like, does it, did it satisfy, you know, there's these beats in between that are kind of like cannon fodder. And then it's like, gut, there's the big stunt. That was pretty cool. You know, or, or did they, ca they didn't capture it. You know, it's like, ah, oh, that, the lens was too tight. You know, you didn't see the hit, um, or where they landed, um. Yeah, it's it's almost it's a it's a feeling really, right? Yeah, I guess so. And then how do you how do you um, like how do you balance your 
your feelings with what's <laughs> with what's true <laughs> you know? yeah uh, i don't i don't know it's there's there's a point where you go like okay that that worked um where where you know you need something big like even this like this thing i was talking about with this 70 year old actor who's a great actor um and he could do a, a lot of things on his own but they're in that fight <clears throat> that i had i had to do like something it's like i'm not doing enough to be there's not enough me overpowering him you know like i need to do something a little over the top and then and then i came up with something that was uh, like a flip and then a, into a kick and i'm like nobody does that but then when i watched it back i was like eh. it works though you know it's a bit over the top yeah it's not realistic like some of the other stuff we're kind of like you know we do some grappling stuff where you know jujitsu and it's like that's a pretty sweet jujitsu move the way the we move the camera and you know even though we had to do a lot of edits it still worked right um but then you know then you you do something that's like ah, nobody's gonna do that in real life in a real fight um but it felt right i was like we needed something bigger there hmm. when you watch jujitsu fights um, mm -hmm. or i guess when you're thinking of a jujitsu fight how do you how do you shoot jujitsu? Well, with jujitsu, you have to it's you have to let the audience in on what's happening, because otherwise otherwise it just looks like a couple of guys rolling around on the ground. You have no idea unless you're unless you know jujitsu, then you're like, oh, he's trying to get a kimura or whatever. He's trying to get that arm and then you know turn it into a uh, you know an arm bar or whatever. Because when you're doing jujitsu. Um, Unless you're like a, a, you know, like a, a white belt or something, you're you're not you're only thinking about like oh what's happening right th now. But as as you progress and you become a higher belt, you're thinking you're setting up, you know, like a funnel. It's like you're setting up like I'm doing these things so you react a certain way in order for me to be able to do this thing that I really want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you're shooting, you it's you can't do that. You can't like foreshadow like the chess move, you know, the final move. Um, that you could do it in a way where it's like once you get there you're like oh that's what he's doing but you know with jujitsu yeah you have to kind of like let them know as they go because everybody's a white belt when they're watching it you know um and so you kind of have to and then you have to like what's gonna make it look good um like i did when i did it it was like a i was setting up a triangle um which is you know whatever but how do you do a triangle and make it look cool? You know, it's like, well, you kind of invert, you spin. All right, well, if you're going to do that, let's make the count, the the camera either counter or follow the spin. So it looks like, what? And then you pull them in. It's like, whoa, okay, that that's kind of cool. Um, so if somebody doesn't know jujitsu, they can kind of see that's almost like doing a big move, you know? Are you um, trying to balance the your audience between, you know, like, you have some of your audience understands jujitsu and some of your audience are just white belts. Are you trying to find some kind of balance between the two? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Cause you, you want, you like, you kind of, those people that don't know, like everything might just be like, ah, oh, this is like, uh, like the raid, you know, it's like, are they doing the same thing over and over? I can't, it just feels like that, you know, but yeah. So you kind of, you kind of have to, anybody that, you, you want to satisfy the people that are, I guess, white belt viewers of action. And, but then those that aren't, you, you, that know the technical aspect to the fight, you know, you kind of want to satisfy that too, if you can. Um, I don't know that I'm thinking about that, um, but I definitely, it's, it's usually like, uh, D does the fight feel real like there was a time when it was like i just want to do the flashiest thing nonstop. like i just want to do a ton of flashy stuff um and i didn't think about like the story of the fight you know you do have to progress in the fight you know um the hero has to like if the hero just likes like he's beating this guy up then it's like okay he's you know there's no it's just that's the fight he's just awesome mm -hmm. um is he supposed to be just awesome you know if it's a final fight no he can't be, but if he's beaten up like some, you know, henchmen or whatever, yeah, he can be awesome. But uh, it's it's better, I think, in the story when you're thinking about the story, you know. Um, I think I've that's something as I've become a better actor, I've I've thought about like, well, I, I don't want to, 
you know, the, f the fight should have a story. You know, there should be some acting within the, the action. You can still do a flashy thing here or there, um, but it almost has to get to that point, I think, you know, or at least for me. That's maybe just a, a personal thing. When you're thinking through those steps of the fight, you're sort of problem solving, right? You're trying to figure out how to go to, from point A to point B to point C. Um, do you lean on acting, gags, camera moves? Do you, do you find yourself going to a certain toolkit, tool set? All of it. <laughs> it's kind of all of it, you know? Um, and then, and I also ask too, because sometimes the camera operator is not an action guy. You know, it's like, how'd that feel to you? It looked good. But then obviously I have these stunt guys, you know, that'll be like, nah, bro, that's, that doesn't, yeah. You know, so you have these guys that you can kind of lean on and be like, what'd you think about that? And it's like, I think we should complicate it or we should probably simplify it because we're not seeing what's happening, you know? Mm. Uh, and that, that you, you know, you, now with, with previs, you, you, that's, you know, you're just doing that. You're problem solving, you know? Um, cause we did previs for this, this thing but we didn't previous the entire fight. It was like portions of it. But I knew when we were doing it, it was like, there's that just, it doesn't look right. But we also didn't have a camera operator. We just had it on sticks, you know, on a tripod. So I was like, we're going to have to get inside this fight for people to know what's going on. Yeah, I would think that having no camera operator on your previs would be quite <laughs> limiting. Pretty tricky. Yeah. yeah. But I guess but if, it's, if you're just something. trying to, if you, if you know, I guess if you know, you know the camera, then you don't have, you don't have to worry about that. Right. It's more about like, you're going to show this to your other stunt guy or you're going to show it to the actor and they're going to have to yeah. do this so that they kind of rehearse it or something. Yeah, right. um, but if I'm editing it, you know, then, then, and which thankfully I was editing this one or was able to at least show them what my edit would be not that they would had to use it but and i don't even know if they did you know it could be completely different but i even would do like if something didn't feel right i even jumped the line you know at a certain place to confuse so the audience was would be like wait a second and i feel like in the edit i crossed the line so that the audience would because the motion is still happening but then they go oh wait a minute and then they kind of like focus in a little bit more they're like, wait, and then they're, then they're in tune. They're like, oh, wait, I, I, now I'm, so it's almost like a trick. <laughs> I don't know if it always works, but I felt like when I cut it that way, there's something that was missing when I was editing the fight. And I was like, I can, it's too easy for me to follow it. And then I, so I jumped the line on the move. So it's like, wait a second, but then it felt right. Huh. So you, you introduced a little bit of, um, a little bit of born in there. Just enough. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I still want to not so close to where it's like doing this the whole time. Um, cause you want to still see the stuff. Um, but I also, know, I mean, I don't know about then, but you know, I know when you, when they're doing that, a lot of times it's to hide something, right. you know? Right. Yeah. That's also supposed to make it a little more intense. Um, you know, cause they could obviously afford a steady cam. <laughs> it's like yeah. they didn't need to put it that way. But, uh, Koichi shot a lot of handheld, though, you yeah. know? Um, but it was never, like, you know, purposely shaking. Mm. I mean, so, I mean, sometimes shaky camera looks pretty good. I mean, The Raid, I think that movie's entirely shaky cam. And Yeah, no, that was good. But it, I did get tired in that one. It is tiring. It's a tiring yeah. movie, especially the end. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, there's a lot of really cool stuff, but then after a while, it just, it did feel like for me, I was like, I think, I mean, and they, they're they really good, but it was just like, oh, man, there's a, I don't know, it's like started feeling like the same thing. Right. You know? the, um, I think that the, like some of the connective tissue between the, the fight scenes is one of its strongest suits, too. Mm -hmm. One of its strong, best traits, I think. Um, and what's the guy's name? I, I could never pronounce his name in know. that. He's got a yeah he's got a certain style too you know when you watch he does a i don't know what it's like something with his hands like when he's like getting ready um it, it's like you see it in all this stuff now it's like oh that's his that's how he moves that's his it's like his it's almost like his own signature it's like that's yeah. his thing um which is cool has anybody ever told you what your signature is no <laughs> i don't even know if i have one <laughs> yeah 
Somebody, even sure I have one. somebody told me one time what he thought my signature was. And it kind of hurt because I was like, I, I don't even notice that. <laughs> What'd they say? Um, it had to do with like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Langayan, uh, the bearded guy in uh, um, which movies would he? He's uh, he's the bearded Hong Kong dude in like Legend of a, Legend of a Fighter. Doesn't have a beard in that. Um, uh, he's in the victim. Uh, Sam Wong movie. Uh, he's uh, <clears throat> he's in the Odd Couple as a villain. He's in all kinds. He's in a bunch of those movies. Old school dude. Uh, His fighting style was very kind of like I don't know. It was very arm based. And I was like, I was trying to kick, but <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you ever, uh, if you ever knew what your like your trademark is right like i mean i scott that, scott atkins talked about this too where he when he was in special forces he was like i was just trying to figure out how like what am i when i stand on screen when i'm there like mm. what is my style i'm doing a pose and then he said for undisputed he's like no more posing the posing's over mm. yeah i don't i don't know what my style would would be it's a different you could see it's different it's like when I first started on um, Power Rangers, I think it almost looked like I was a Taekwondo guy. Mm. Uh, but I wasn't. Everyone thought I was, but uh, I was a Kung Fu guy. Um, but we never really did Kung Fu um, on that. <clears throat> There's only certain times. That There's actually a Power Rangers episode called Game of Honor. Was, and then we did a little bit of actual Kung Fu stuff in it. Um <clears throat> But then in that one, so when I actually Game of Honor, if you watch the opening, Koichi shot that and it looks great. It's cool. It's like a ninja fight and, you know, uh, not a whole lot of Kung Fu, but the movement felt like Kung Fu, you know, and it was shot right. But later, like I do like a Chinese broadsword thing and, I'm, and then the way it was shot, it was shot by first unit. And I was like, ugh. You know? <laughs> and the final, there's like a fight in that one too like a and i was like yeesh it just wasn't it wasn't shot like if koichi was shooting it it would have been really awesome and he would have like adjusted things so that it was correct but you know it's like actually that's a that was probably one we could have watched and we've been like oh that looks cool and then you know why does this stink <laughs> just a straight master shot you know it's why does like, this stink that's a great <laughs> name for this segment <laughs> <laughs> do mst 3k commentary on <laughs> famous fight scenes um all right johnny i'll let you go man thanks so much for of course, doing the thank live you. stream um and i uh, got a lot of good questions in so thanks everybody for watching yeah well thanks man thanks for having me uh we should do it again it's yeah. fun all right cool man yes.